Good morning. Welcome to worship in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Pastor Jim, and I'm so happy you have chosen to be with us in worship, either in person, online, or by video. Uh, so welcome to worship. And we are happy today because we have starting with us a student assistant pastor, Carrie Dowdy. And Pastor Carrie is from Butler and used to be from Valencia, grew up in Valencia, right? And um, her and her husband, Brian, are with us today. So please join us after worship down in Fellowship Hall for a short welcome luncheon for them um, in their honor. And Pastor Carrie will be working with us as part of her field education at Pittsburgh Seminary from now through May. And so please welcome them as part of our church family. And this education, it's for her education, but it's also for your and my spiritual growth. So she's going to teach us as much as we teach her, right? No pressure. Um, so let's give her a warm welcome um, after worship today, her and Brian, and try to get the, to know them. Um, she will be with us most every Sunday, at least. Um, and uh, we're thrilled that she and Valencia have been matched together by the seminary. So uh, we're looking forward to the coming days of spiritual growth. Uh, today we're going to talk about faith, real faith. And um, real faith versus ritual faith. Do you feel like sometimes you're just going through the motions? You're just doing the same thing every Sunday or every week even. So there's a difference and scripture teaches us that there are ways to break out of that going through the motions and to allow God to make your faith come alive and give you the life that he has designed for you and I. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Before we do that, get started, we have an announcement from Anna Mary. Well, our rummage sale items keep on giving and blessing others all over the world. I just wanted to share this little card with you. It says, blessed are the givers and grateful are the receivers. Thank you so much. Our church mission team is truly thankful for all the donations that we received from your garage sale. We will be passing them on here, which is in Middlesex, and in West Virginia, Romania, and India. God is working through all of us with Christian love and blessings, Glade Run Church. So those are our neighbors and your donations are going all over the world. Thank you, Anna Mary. Before we uh, prepare our hearts and minds for worship, um, Matt McKinley has an update for us on our fundraising. Good morning. So, uh, like Pastor Jim said, I'm here to give an update. If you could go to the next slide, please. As we've said all along, we have three phases to the Fellowship Hall renovation. The first phase was, I'm happy to say, was the exterior painting of Fellowship Hall. That is completed. If you haven't checked it out, you should. It, it looks great now. So thanks to Jay for setting that up. And, and yeah, and, and uh, just following through that. It took a while to get there, but we finally got there with that. Phase two, as you know, is the renovation of the restrooms in Fellowship Hall, and that, as, as I understand it, is to begin in September. So just around the corner, we will be beginning soon. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Before September. So that's, that's awesome. Thank you, Tammy. So next slide. I have more good news. So our original goal for fundraising was $10,000. I am thrilled to say, and it, was, it is before I ever dreamed that this would be possible, that we hit our goal. We're already over $10,000. So. 
And that is on top of the regular giving that we've had. And the regular giving has stayed steady. So thank you all, and, and, and God bless you all. Um, so because we are doing that and we are at this point in the fundraising, prior to the fundraising, we were going to pull $17,000 out of the general fund to cover it. And we have that money there, and we could have covered it no problem. This $10,000 that we've raised so far is offsetting that. But because we reached that goal so quickly, we are resetting the goal. And we're going to, to try and attain $15,000. So I, I issue that challenge to you. Uh, thank you so much for your giving to date. And uh, let's, let's continue to go with that. Um, so we will be resetting that one for 15000 If we can go to the next slide, and I know that might be difficult to read, uh, with our student pastor efforts, and as Jim did, we introduced Pastor Kerry today, we have this year taken care of with the student pastor funding. But what we're doing is trying to raise funding for future years. And to date already, we have $2,700 towards that. And that is outstanding. So I wanted to report that to you as well. So keeping the regular giving where it is, hitting our $10,000 goal, and then this $2,700 on top of that, it's just amazing for this church. So thank you very much. Uh, and on to the last slide. I, I had this slide up before, and I talked about, um, and this was a Rick Warren devotion, but giving by reason and giving by revelation. And I'm not going to read it to you, and I'm not going to reiterate what I said last time, but I just want to go to the last bullet on there. And my prayer for you is that your barns will be filled and your vats will overflow with the finest of wines. So thank you again. I appreciate it. Thank you, Matt, for coordinating our efforts and giving us an update. Um, I think we can probably look forward to more updates in the future, I hope, um, as we continue to give to glorify God and take care of what he's given us here, uh, to be good stewards of that. So without any further delay, uh, let's be called to worship. Um, good morning. Let us begin with the, the call to worship that you'll find on the screen or in your bulletin. Summer wanes and the autumn draws close. Lord, help us be ready for opportunities to serve. We have felt the refreshment of time away. Come, let us celebrate God's eternal presence and love. So please join me and stand if you're able to sing the opening hymn, Rejoice, Ye Pure, pure in Heart. <coughs> God greets us, and this is our time to greet one another. So this greeting of each other is one, let me start that over. This greeting of each other that we call the passing of Christ's peace. 
So in a short time, so every one of us will respond to each other in God's greeting here in worship. So we extend the peace of Jesus Christ to each other by waving, placing your hand on your heart or the peace sign. So let us all greet one another. And this morning, our call to confession. So we know that nothing is able, that we know that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. So let us confess together in this freedom of all the wrongs we, we have done. Let us pray together aloud using our prayer of confession. Awesome and compassionate God, you have loved us with unfailing, self-giving mercy, but we have not loved you. You call us, but we do not listen. You ask us to love, but we do walk away from neighbors in need. Wrapped in our own concerns, we condone evil, prejudice, warfare, and greed. Grace, as you come to us in mercy, we repent in spirit and in truth. We admit our sin and gratefully receive your forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Friends in Christ, it is in and by through Jesus Christ that we are forgiven. Know this and be at peace. Pastor Jim will bring the, the message for the children. Thank you. Tyler and Maya, two of my biggest fans, or should I say friends, two of my biggest friends. Are you friends? Do you know each other? No? This is Maya, Ty. Maya, this is Ty. Okay, now you know each other. Oh, we're going to talk about faith and um, the keys to our faith. Do you know what all these keys are for? Who laughed? <laughs> for what? Doors. That's a good guess. I gotta find one that's not a door. Wait a minute. Nope, this is not a door. It's a cabinet, it's a cabinet door. So you're they are all keys around this church. And I would venture to say this is most of the keys in our church. The medical lending closet is on here, all the files in the office, um, all the doors. Um, the nursery emergency door is even on here. And these, well, okay, let's, so let's talk about this. So if you don't have the right key for the door you're trying to open, it won't open, right? It might go in the lock, but it won't turn, right? You ever experienced that? It's a lot the same as our faith. We need keys to unlock the power of God like doors yeah yeah exactly but you have to have the right key scripture tells us that faith our faith is the right key and we've been given that key by god himself so even though your faith might look the right way or you might do the right things every sunday you might sing loud during worship do either of you sing loud you do? Excellent. That's a good thing, but that in itself will not unlock the power of God in your life. No. You need, you need another key for that. 
So this smaller set, you know what these are? These are my keys. No, not car keys. Good guess, though. Yep, there's a house key. There's a house key, there's a church key. There's only two keys on here. Well, actually, there's three. There's a fob also. That's for the church. This is a church door key, and this is my house key. And it says on it, Valencia Presbyterian Church, Valencia, PA, on my key ring. But if I were to put this key or this, hold this fob up to my doorway next door, it wouldn't do anything. It's not the right key, right? Even though it says Valencia Presbyterian Church, if I put my front door key in the door outside of the church, it won't open it. It's, it will. It's not the right key. We need the right key for our faith. How do we find the right key to our, of our faith, do you think? The key of our faith. Any idea? Would it be in here, Tyler? Yeah, you can find them in there. Yeah, that'll strengthen your faith by reading God's word. Can you find the right key by singing in worship, by coming to worship? You can find it that way, yep. That's not the only thing you need, though. Can you, see, can you find it by talking to all these friendly folks around you today, do you think? That'll strengthen your faith. That'll strengthen your faith. Can you, can you find it by praying to God and talking to him? Uh-huh. So you need, we need all of those things. We need all of those keys to give us the key of faith. Right? Let's have a prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the keys to our faith, including lots of things, lots of acts, lots of things to do and say and to be, but the one key that we need is faith in you. Help us to find that each day. Through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys. Our prayer for illumination this morning. Lord God, you have declared that your kingdom is among us. Open our eyes to see it, our ears to hear it, our hearts to hold it, our hands to serve it. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And our next hymn is Have Thine Own Way, Lord. This morning's Old Testament reading is from Isaiah 29 verses 13 through 16. And so the Lord says, these people say they are mine, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, and their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules learned by rote. 
Because of this, I will once again astound these hypocrites with amazing wonders. The wisdom of the wise will pass away, and the intelligence of the intelligent will disappear. What sorrows await those who try to hide their plans from the Lord, who does their evil deeds in the dark. The Lord can't see us, they say. He doesn't know what's going on. How foolish can you be? He is the potter, and he is certainly greater than you, the clay. Should the, the created thing say to the one who made it, he didn't make me? Does a jar ever say, the potter who made me is stupid? So what is a ritual? And, and let me ask it a different way. Why do we do the things that we do over and over and over again? Some call those habits. Some call those routines. And we like routine, don't we? Right? Do all, any of you do anything over and over the same way? I see some nods. We like that, don't we? We don't have to think about it. It's a habit. When it becomes a habit, you just do it. Well, if we have OCD. <laughs> <laughs> like me. <laughs> we do them over and over, and that gives us a sense of comfort, a sense of joy, a sense of security. It's like list makers. How many of you are list makers? Put your hand up. Be honest, Crystal. I know you are. <laughs> Anybody else? There's a sense of comfort in that, right? You can check things off your list and I've accomplished. Look what I did today, right? Until something goes the, not the way that you thought it would go on your list and you can't get that last thing done. Does that happen to anybody? Absolutely. So then what do you rely on? Well, as Christians, we should be relying on God first and our list second, right? He will help us make our list, in fact. And some of those things that we do in our faith lives over and over and over the same way. For instance, worship. Every Sunday, we do certain things in here, right? And sometimes they can become routine or they become routine for sure. They become habits for sure, but they also can become meaningless. We just go through the motions. Just get up Sunday morning, put your certain clothes on, get in the car, go to Valencia, sit down and worship, go through the order of worship the same way each week. Do we really pay attention to the words to the Lord's Prayer? Do we really pay attention to the Apostles' Creed words? Do we really pay attention to the Prayer of Confession words, or are we just reading them off the screen? You get my point. Things lose meaning if they're too routine, and we don't think about them, our heart's not in them. That's the difference between ritual and real faith. And Jesus called this out among some Pharisees in the Gospel of Mark, in many places, but in the Gospel of Mark today. We're going to read from Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. And this is the New Living Translation version, so it's a little different than your pew Bibles. But read along with me from Mark 7, 1 to 8. One day, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. 
they noticed that some of his disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual of hand washing before eating. The Jews, especially the Pharisees, do not eat until they have poured water over their cupped hands, as required by their ancient traditions. Similarly, they don't eat anything from the market until they immerse their hands in water. This is but one of many traditions they have clung to, such as their ceremonial washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of religious law asked him, why don't your disciples follow our age-old tradition? They eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony. Jesus replied, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. May God bless our hearing of his word this day. All praise, honor, and glory go to him. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I am confident that most of us, if not all of us, would agree on our preferences for having the following people in our lives. A son or a daughter who shows respect and uses good manners. Right? Parents? Most parents would agree that would be wonderful. A husband or wife who is always thoughtful, always courteous and gracious in both comments and deeds. Always. Most married couples would agree with that. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a friend who always treats you with consideration? I think, of course, that would be great also. And it would be wonderful to have a neighbor who conscientiously takes care of their property while respecting your property, right? But think about this. As wonderful as all of those people would be in our lives, none of them compare to a neighbor, a friend, a husband, a wife, a son, or a daughter with a good heart, with a genuinely good heart. You see, if they have a genuine good heart, all of those other things will come along also. Whenever we get too caught up with good behavior, we are focusing on the quality of a person's self-control. However, whenever we consider their heart, we're focusing on the quality of the person. Their heart is who they are, not just what they do or how they act in certain situations. Now, a good heart will come through in certain situations and eventually, it will come through in all that they do and say. Their heart is the key. It's the same principle in our faith as we live it out every day. It's the difference between a ritual faith or a real faith. That is what Jesus was calling out in our passage today, this morning, the ritual faith of those Pharisees and anyone else who was listening. Interestingly enough, these Pharisees and teachers are gathered around Jesus and they are watching the disciples eat, <laughs> right? It seems the disciples are eating their lunch, too tired and too hungry to cut care their, that their hands and their faces are all dirty. They immediately sat down to eat without washing in the ceremonial washing. In fact, it was not the dirty hands that the observers were criticizing. It was the fact that the disciples did not participate in the traditional ceremonial pouring of the water over the hands. 
Well, the Pharisees jump on this ceremonial oversight and they question Jesus. And they say, why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of all the elders and clean their hands before they eat? Well, that's all that Jesus needs to hear, right? He sticks up for his disciples. He turns on these teachers and he says, in essence, why don't you live according to the traditions of God and clean your hearts? Those are Jim Kirk's words, not Jesus. What was Jesus warning the Pharisees about? What exactly was their mistake? And more importantly, what is Jesus saying to us about our lives of faith? What is the warning for us here in the 21st century? I think there are three main ways to explain Jesus' warning to us today, here. First, do not prefer traditions over truth. Second, do not look at the outside habits, but rather the inside motivations. And thirdly, and lastly, God is focused on our good hearts, not just our good rituals. Notice that Jesus did not say to do away with every tradition the Pharisees taught. He didn't say that. Traditions are good things. Every church has them. Every family has them. Every person has them. But our tradition should never stand in the way of God's truth. To love our neighbor, honor our parents, for example, the Pharisees thought they had mastered all of God's laws. So they came up with some of their own rules and laws, one of them being hand washing, ceremonial hand washing. There was another rule, though, that the Pharisees had called Corban or Corban. Anybody ever heard of that? Corban. This rule said that when a gift was devoted to God, it couldn't be rescinded, it couldn't be changed at all. Corban, the Pharisees demanded, was a gift devoted to God exclusively. Family members may be suffering, but don't break your promise to God. Don't give to your family, give to your Corban. That kind of strict adherence to tradition is a religion that covers up God's truth. Let's say, just for an example's sake, let's say you pledge a certain amount of money next year to VPC. Let's say it's $10,000. A pastor can dream, right? Nobody nodded yes. <laughs> that money is Corbin. It has been devoted to God. Now that's a good thing in itself, but... Then tragedy strikes, lives change, challenges come up, your parents need financial help. As your pastor, I expect you to reduce your gift to VPC and give to your parents. Matt doesn't want to hear me say that, but <laughs> yes, that's what I would expect. God's truth through Moses' commandment is to honor your parents and you have to decide whether the, your parents are more important or your pledge to VPC is more important. In that example, in 2022, your parents are more important. The Pharisees got into trouble because they used their Corbin rule to lock people into gifts that they could not keep when trouble came. That's not love, that's law. That's not living from the truth in your heart. That's living under the constraints of a tradition only. That's Jesus' first warning. So secondly, and next, the warning is not look so closely at outside rituals, but rather to the inside motivations. It's very interesting that the Pharisees, these Pharisees, chose to send a delegation all the way from Jerusalem to Galilee, a 60-mile journey. 
That's the background for this conversation. That, that delegation is not there to, for a spot of tea. That's not why they came. They've traveled to observe for a while and their presence was probably not welcomed by anyone. We do not know how long they were staying, but the usual reason for this kind of visit from Jerusalem was a fault-finding mission. They were looking to find fault with somebody, probably Jesus, first. These Pharisees were not there by accident or to be nice or social. They were looking for any reason to hang Jesus Christ, so they observed his disciples. These are his closest friends, his followers. And they discover a minor infraction. The disciples were blamed for not performing the religious ritual of hand washing before they ate, which was considered an unclean act. Now, what does unclean mean to them? The obvious explanation, as you might have guessed, is dirty hands, right? Every parent knows about dirty hands for their kids. You know, germs, bacteria, or just plain dirt. But the practice of washing was not done by the Pharisees for reasons of health. That's not what they're talking about. That's not what they're looking for. In fact, it was done for religious purity. That's what they were looking for. It was thought that the normal activities and circumstances of everyday life made any Jew unclean before God. Pouring water over the hands washed away this uncleanliness. For us, this becomes an interesting question. Can outside rituals make us inside saints? What, right? Can the things we do outside ex exterior so everybody can see, does that make us a saint inside? Today for us, we might ask ourselves about all of our own rituals. Take for our worship, for example, with the reciting of the Lord's Prayer and the Prayer of Confession or the Apostles' Creed, make your heart clean just because you say them once a week? I see some of you nodding. <laughs> No, it will not. Of course not. We all should know better than that. However, there are some very good benefits to us when we recite those parts of our worship service. They do bring us closer to God. They do bring us closer to each other. They do speak to the Holy Spirit who acts on our behalf. Open in opens our hearts, opens our minds to God's voice, and serve to strengthen our faith. For these Pharisees and teachers, that question becomes, do clean hands make for a clean heart? To answer this, Jesus called the crowd to his side when with the Pharisees and teachers looking on, he says to them, nothing outside a person can make them unclean by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that makes them unclean. Think about that for a moment. It's not what goes into a person that makes them unclean. It's what comes out, like your words, like your thoughts, like your actions. Dirty hands don't make a dirty heart. From within, Jesus said, not from without. It's the inside motivations, not the outside rituals that determine our cleanliness before God. And he sees right in there every day. It's greed, not grime. It's malice, not money. It's deceit, not dirt. It's arrogance, not alcohol that makes us unclean. Water will not wash away sexual immorality either. Religious rituals will not cleanse us from envy, from selfishness, from arrogant pride. All those evils, Jesus said, come from inside and make a person unclean in God's eyes. 
And lastly, there's a warning that God is interested more in our good hearts than just our good rituals. You really have to think slowly through this story to get at this last point. Jesus is letting us know that God requires good hearts and good habits in that order. And he's also saying God requires real faith, not just ritual faith. On a first reading, it sounds as though Jesus might be condemning ritualistic religion, but he's not. No, rituals can be good things. If pouring water over our hands ceremonially to remove dirt reminds us that we need daily to cleanse our hearts and practice generosity, kindness, humility, faithfulness, fidelity, that's a good thing, right? That becomes a good thing, that ritual. If, on the other hand, we think that simple act of pouring water over our hands makes us acceptable before God, that's a bad thing. You see the difference? Let me also mention a good word about creeds, because I've blasted them now, including the Apostles' Creed, (laughs) the Lord's Prayer, our prayer of confession. These are all good parts of our worship service. They are necessary tools for us to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. On several Sundays, we say the Apostles' Creed. Not today, but on several Sundays, we either say the Apostles' Creed or any of the other creeds that are in our Constitution. And the church has been saying that creed for almost 1,900 years, probably a little more than that. We've been praying the Lord's Prayer which, since Jesus taught it to his disciples. They said, how, Lord, do we pray? And he told them the Lord's Prayer. These are some of our rituals, our traditions. Does saying these things make you holy or give you eternal life? Of course not. No. Does memorizing the words make you a saint? Of course not. But... If from your heart you earnestly believe all that the creeds teach us and the Lord's Prayer says, then you are becoming holy. You are becoming a saint. Friends, you can perform all the right rituals and recite word for word the creeds, but they won't make you clean before God. Your faith, if it's real faith, is from here. It's from the heart. And of course, God knows our hearts and can change our hearts also. In closing today, I want to read for you part of an interview with a Christian contemporary artist named Matthew West. Anybody familiar with Matthew West? Thanks, there's a few. (laughs) His songs are very singable. (laughs) I sing in the car all the time to Matthew West. And he he was asked in this interview how and why he wrote the song, The Motions, in 2009. This praise song speaks to this feeling of just going through the motions, right, in our faith. So listen to what Matthew West said when asked about this song, that he, he wrote this song right after surgery. He had had surgery and lost his voice. Does your faith journey, he said, does your faith journey ever have these desert seasons? I think one of the greatest challenges in actively living out a relationship with Christ on earth is to avoid the trap of simply going through the motions. I know what a Christian should say. I know how a Christian should act. I know how to put up a spiritual front, even if I'm not passionately seeking God. That's why I wrote this song. I was frustrated. I was tired of that constant settling for a stale faith. God is a God of passion. His true plan for our lives is anything but boring. Every day, the God of adventure beckons his sons and daughters to quit going through the motions and walk into a life filled with passion and wonder. The last line of the chorus strikes me every time I sing it. 
It goes like this. I don't want to spend my whole life asking, what if I had given everything instead of going through the motions? Matthew Wesch finished up this interview with this. My surgery in silence really brought this song to life for me. Trials force movement. Pain makes you feel. I'm thankful for the difficult time I had to go through because God used it to remind me that going through the motions is not really living. That was Jesus' warning to the Pharisees and to us. Is your faith real or are you just going through the motions? If it's not real and you're not really living, ask God for help to make it real and he will. Amen. In our prayer time, we want to lift up people, places, circumstances on our hearts and minds this day. So what are they today? Joys, concerns, thankfulness, praise, requests, all of it. Karen. Did you see your hand go up like that? Can you do the other one? No. I didn't think so. And I also want prayers for Zach Sprout, who is having surgery this week. And I Thank you, Karen. We can pray for Zach. Sure. Brian. That's Reverend Mary. I'm sorry. Pastor Monica. Got it. Thank you, Brian. Ed. Mary Laura. Thank you, Mary Laura. Ed, Bob, and Susan. We can pray for them. Officer Michael. Yeah, I don't want to give his last name. Who's still at Presby? He was stabbed in Butler. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, you are the compassionate God of our lives. And we like to think that all we have to do is be religious, to speak the words, but that we really don't have to walk the walk. 
We can get so caught up in ritual and rules that we forget the essence of your word for us and to us. We forget that we are called to truly be people of peace, not just to speak the words, but to practice lives of compassion and hope. So many times in this world we are challenged to take sides one against the other, but that is contrary to your will. You call us to stand for mercy, justice, love, forgiveness, hope, and peace. You want us to be people who care deeply about others and about this world. Help us, Lord God, to be ready to truly and joyfully serve you. Free us from selfishness and self-centeredness. Lift us to the lives of peace, your peace. Lord God, you have heard our prayer request today. We lift up prayers for Zach in Afghanistan, for the families of the men who were killed, have been killed, for all the people trying to get out of Afghanistan. Provide for their safety. Provide for their loving care. Provide for their healing. Provide for them, Lord, as Lord of their lives. We pray for Pastor Monica and her health concerns and whatever it requires. Lord God, be with the surgeons, specialists, people taking care of Monica. Help her in her health challenge and also in her recovery. Walk with her through that recovery. Lord God, we pray for people that have gotten extraordinary health care and have recovered by your hand. We pray for Susan. We lift up Susan, Ed, and Bob, as all of them are still facing some challenges, but are thankful for what they've received already. Guide them, be with them, lend your healing hand upon them in the coming days and weeks that they would come to know you as their Lord and Savior and that you are walking with them, taking them by the hand. We pray for Officer Michael, who is at Presby. We pray that he would be healed, that he would be taken care of, that he is in your hands. Guide the specialists and surgeons and all those taking care of Michael and guide the person who you um, have taken that caused those injuries. And the people of Butler, give them your healing in that neighborhood. Lord God, you see our hearts, you know our hearts. Let our hearts not be far from you. Help us to reach out to our neighbors even when we are busy or tired. Let us tear down walls when we'd rather let them stand or build them up. Stretch us, please. Lord, sometimes the best thing we can do for others is to pray for them, and you have promised to hear us when we pray and listen to us and answer our prayers in your perfect time and in your perfect ways. Do that for us this day as we've lifted up these prayer requests and all of those unspoken. We ask for your healing power and strength and peace for all the concerns and requests. Whether we are visiting someone, offering a smile, feeding the hungry, or praying in worship or at home, be within us so that whatever we do, we do with your love and direction. Let the world know we are your disciples, not because our hands are clean, but because they're soiled with the mark of your people. We offer all of these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, who taught us when we pray to say these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to do a short liturgy of commitment because you all 
have covenanted through me to support Carrie in her journey to ministry. So on the screen is the responses. Today, as we enter into a covenant with Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and Carrie Dowdy as she prepares for ministry by pursuing theological education, the commitment to receive a seminarian and to serve as a place for a seminarian's practice of ministry is one way we affirm a person's call from God to prepare for leadership in Christ's church. Your intention to prepare yourself for ministry will require diligent and prayerful work. We promise to assist you in that work and in your pilgrimage of learning. We covenant with Pittsburgh Theological Seminary to provide opportunities for you to minister with us, to us, teach us, and learn from us. We pledge to be a partner in your formation for ministry by helping you develop competencies and the skills for ministry, the practical wisdom you will need as a minister, and the spiritual formation that will strengthen your service. With you, we seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit as the future opens before you, and we invite you to call on us whenever, wherever we may be helpful to you in your preparation and study. So as you enter this covenant with us, do you promise to seek our guidance and wisdom to receive our support and to minister to us faithfully? I do, with God's help. Do you all, the members of this congregation, as you enter this covenant with Carrie Dowdy and with Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, pledge to support Carrie as she continues the pilgrimage of learning? Do you agree to receive her preaching, administration, care, and leadership? And do you promise to sustain her with encouragement and support? Let us pray together. God, giver of gifts for the body of Christ, we thank you for those in our generation who hear and answer your call to prepare for ministry in your church. We thank you for the institutions of learning that nurture their call and prepare them for service. Grant your Holy Spirit to carry that she may grow in faith, be filled with courage, and increase in wisdom. Grant that we too may grow in faith as we learn to support her theological education and become a partner in her formation. Amen. So in the name of Jesus Christ, I declare that Valencia Presbyterian Church, Carrie Dowdy, and Pittsburgh Theological Seminary have entered into this covenant of formation for ministry. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The offering in our worship service is a vital part of our response to God's word. It helps us to connect our praise of God with our life of discipleship. The money given for our offering, whether it is here in worship or by mail or online, it is a token and symbol of our desire to devote our whole selves to God's work. The word offering implies something freely given, given in dedication and devotion. So here at VPC, this is never just a collection. Let us continue to offer our first fruits to God as a praise of him. And let me pray for all of our offerings today and every day. Please pray with me. Gracious God of our lives, from your hand we have freely received, accept the offerings today and every day of your people as expressions of thanks. Lovingly remember those who have given, enrich the lives of those for whom these gifts are intended, and use these gifts to promote goodwill and to bring your kingdom closer. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please stand if you're able and join me in the closing hymn, God of the Ages, Whose Almighty Hand.
God of the ages, whose almighty hand leads forth in beauty of a starry band of shining worlds in splendor. Remember, you go nowhere by accident. Where you go, where you are, where you find yourself, God has placed you there for a purpose. And Jesus Christ living inside of you will prepare you, strengthen you, and walk you through that purpose. So go with the love of God, the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the fellowship, guidance, and strength of the Holy Spirit today and every day. Amen.